hope you've enjoyed uh, the morning so far, and I'm uh, uh, thrilled to engage this conversation with the most interesting uh, group of people uh, today. Uh, feel free as uh, panelists to uh, jump in in the conversation. We want to pretend we're actually at the breakfast table or the dinner table, and uh, these people are just hanging out. Uh, uh, so uh, we will also open it up to questions uh, in a few minutes as well. So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our panel for starters. Uh, um, Bill Barhide, who's just to my immediate right. You heard Dr. Shaw say uh, uh, what we believe is that mobile money can be a game changer with virtually everyone in the world having a, a mobile phone. If you could turn that into a digital wallet, uh, um, incredible things could happen. And uh, to uh, Raul and Hosa's comment, that can be an incredibly important uh, an effective uh, mechanism to get, uh, whether it's remittances or loans or investments or uh, um, all sorts of things directly to uh, buy an agricultural input to, uh, um, to do um, uh, education. So Bill uh, is one of those uh, entrepreneurs that we um, love and adore. He's the co-founder and CEO of Boom Financial. You may have uh, uh, heard about it uh, first as MVIA, and he'll tell you a little bit about that, uh, but it's really aimed at uh, um, increasing the uh, senders and recipients of domestic and cross-border across countries and been uh, uh, hugely innovative in that space. So uh, he also hails uh, um, from doing work with the CIA and NASA and Goldman Sachs, so has a great background. To his right, we are incredibly honored to have uh, um, Dr. Uh, Gambisa Ijeta, and he is the 2009 World Prize uh, Food Prize Laureate, and so we really appreciate you here today. He hails from Purdue University and is one of the leading plant uh, scientists in the world and I think has a lot to say about how do we, beyond remittances, take that science and technology, grow it globally as well as connect it uh, for the better of everybody. And then um, to uh, his right, uh, we are also honored to have um, Dr. Hale um, Isfandiara, is that have I? Dear. Okay. And she is the director of the Mideast program Woodrow Wilson International Center for uh, Scholars. Uh, she wrote an award-winning book called My Prison, My Home, One Woman's Story of Ca uh, Captivity in Iran, um, based on her arrest by Iranian security authorities in 2007. So we have an interesting mix of people on this panel from security issues to food security issues to uh, economic growth and remittances. So, uh, uh, so we'll just uh, jump in. So Bill, let me start with you. And um, I already told you that I thought that uh, uh, mobile money was one of the biggest game changers uh, uh, in the world. So how do you think that, uh, and I know you're one of the uh, uh, founding supporters of the international diaspora. Um, tell us how you approach your core customer base, uh, immigrant family supporting. Um, you know, we are, we have a number of entrepreneurs in this background. You know, you had this uh, idea as a twinkle in your eye. What have been some of the tough challenges and the opportunities have you grown your business over the last few years? Sure. Uh, so you asked how we look at our customer base. Uh, we, we look at it a little bit differently than kind of traditional cash remittance companies might, might look at the problem. Uh, we started out um, spending a lot of time uh, back in, in remote villages in several countries that were traditional recip are traditional recipients of, of U.S. remittances to understand uh, how they lived, the usage patterns of the money they were receiving, um, how often they received money, why they received money, uh, the trials and tribulations of receiving money. Um, and then, in, in a lot of cases, would go back to the town in the U.S., uh, much to the surprise of people that we would meet and say, oh, I just met with your uncle who told me where you live, and would you mind spending a few minutes with us? And after they got over their shock, um, they would, were very willing to do that. And what we ultimately discovered is, is that um, this is, uh, it's really a social networking challenge, right? We, we believe that if you can bring everyone who is in that cash economy into the, a traditional financial system, uh, that uh, you basically end up with a kind of a, uh, uh, the tide that, that raises all boats, right? And that's how we look at, at, at banking. And so the question for us was, was how could we create 
a social network almost using the mobile phone that would connect people in real time so that instead of sharing photos, you're actually sharing money. Uh, and, and, and my sharing money with someone via text message would instantly create uh, effectively a, a bank account for that individual. That's how we looked at the problem and, and the customer. And, and to your second question about the challenges, uh, I, I mean, it's been years of challenges. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the most So regular. any number of them, right? <laughs> I mean, outside of launching a drug or maybe or some healthcare device, it's probably the most regulated business in the world. Um, and the regulations just, they pile on top of each other almost on a weekly basis. Uh, in the United States, every state regulates uh, cross-border transactions as well as the federal government, as well as the recipient markets. Um, and, and so we've spent years and, and a lot of money navigating that regulatory playing field in order to make it you know, transparent. So give this uh, audience a little bit of the tricks of the trade. What have you found particularly helpful as you've navigated that complex regulatory environment? Yeah. Um, Besides listening. Well, you have to have people who know the regulation involved. Yeah. Um, but that aside, uh, what we've done, I, I think we're the only company in the world that's taken this approach is uh, instead of um, creating, uh, you, you probably, if you're from Africa, you've read a lot about these um, wallet accounts, mobile wallet accounts. We've gone one step further, and we're actually engaging with credit unions all around the world and are, and are only creating credit union accounts for our customers. So these are real, uh, in the case of the United States, uh, federally insured accounts, and like in the case of Haiti, they're, they're integrated into the Le Levier uh, uh, Caisse Popular system. And so, um, on the one hand, um, we're dealing with a lot of organizations who share our passion for social responsibility, um, but we can also offload some of the burden uh, on, on, on some of the regulation. Ultimately, the, the, the buck does stop with us because we are the ones who are consumer facing. But, but that's actually been a big breakthrough. And yeah. it's taken us years to work out all of those details yeah. and how it to do that. It also seems to me that one of the interesting things about it is it also plugs these people immediately into a form of financial system, which right. um, can uh, help enormously. Let's go to all the way to the end, to um, Dr. Halle. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. Before yes. you ask yes. me. Uh -huh. What about the local governments? How do you deal with them? We know that in certain countries they are very much there is a lot of corruption and so on. I mean, that's more interesting also to, to see how you deal yeah. with them. Uh, Sorry. I'll give you an example. Um, in, in Haiti, uh, traditional cash remittance companies now have to pay a tax uh, to the new government uh, for, um, in, in order for someone to receive a remittance. Uh, and to my knowledge, it's the only kind of major tax uh, tax on top of you know, uh, a remittance that, that, that a recipient has to pay. And there's a lot of questions about where that money's going. Um, and, you know, there's very little accountability in place. I have, I have very little opinion on where the money's going. I haven't spent a lot of time researching it. Um, but my opinion would be it would be better managed by the recipients of the money as opposed to the government. But they see that there's, you know, 20% of GDP and, you know, I can potentially, you know, have my... Get have a my piece, piece of that. Get a piece of that. And, so uh, while mobile money can be a really effective anti-corruption mechanism, um, the bad guys always try to stay uh, one step ahead. But, and so uh, it but sounds there's the, like... there's the flip side of that, which uh, Moore knows the story very well because USAID was involved in this. When, when mobile money was deployed uh, as a test in Afghanistan, uh, it exposed a lot of the corruption that was in place in local law enforcement agencies who were having a big piece of their salary skimmed. So when they started receiving money, uh, their salary via mobile money, the people that were skimming the salary couldn't skim it anymore, so they were all getting raises. And nobody could understand at first why there was more money showing up than when they were receiving their salary kind of so they thought the mobile away. phone company was giving them a 30% raise. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so it so goes I do both think, ways. Yeah, so I think this anti-corruption thing. Let's go to, um, uh, to a subject that's uh, um, both personal and professionally important um, to you, uh, uh, doctor. And that is, for many um, diasporans, they left their country not by choice but by force. And uh, what insights and perspectives can you share about re-engaging when you're home, with your home, when in fact it is uh, um, in a political regime that, uh, that may be difficult and uh, may not support your hopes and dreams? And what experience, um, and how does your experience affect your work in the U.S.? Um, the problem is that 
you are fa engaging with Iran, you are having uh, two major problems. One is Iran, and the other one is also some of the diaspora in the United States, because you know the majority would like to engage with the home country, but there are also very strong diasporas in, in the United States with very strong feelings who necessarily don't want any kind of engagement between the diaspora and the Iran for whatever reason, you know. But the problem with Iran is that they are very um, suspicious of the motives of the diaspora who wants to get involved, yeah. you know. Not if you go and you want to set up a business, for example, no. But in my field, I mean, I deal with, you know, the humanities, I deal with uh, uh, civil societies, I dealt with university professors, I dealt with journalists, you know, policy makers certain, uh, most of the time. And I really always believe that engagement would help, especially two countries that have been enemies for 32 years, the United States and uh, um, Iran. But the Iranian government did neither appreciate nor understand those of us who were trying to project by bringing Iranians from Iran to project a better image of that country rather than the image of hostage takers and you know all the negative image that we have had in the US. And I personally paid dearly for it. I mean, I ended up in jail right. because they just could not understand that there was no political motive behind this engagement. So that I was not interested in overthrowing the regime. This was not my job. I was interested to work with civil society on the ground. I was interested in bringing uh, the best and the brightest to speak here in conferences, you know, to interact between their counterparts, yeah. but it was misunderstood. So many people from other countries find themselves in that same position, um, where they want to engage with their company, uh, country of origin, um, but they may be um, politically uh, uh, suspicious or, frankly, difficult times. So for those in the audience and on the web, what advice, given your experience, not just in Iran, but in other countries, about how if you want to do the kind of work you do, how do you do it successfully? What are some of the tricks of the trade that you've found um, to, to not have others land up in jail uh, as a result of the work that they've done? Yeah. Um, my advice is don't be intimidated. Don't be scared. Continue to do what you did. I mean, I left Iran 10 days after I was released, and I came back, and I work at the Wilson Center, which is in this building. So they organized the press conference for me, and my first statement was, please continue to engage. I mean, because I believe that if there is engagement, especially between two governments, the dangers of misunderstanding and people like me, and I'm not the only one, there are other dual nationals who ended up in jail, not only in Iran, in other countries too. I mean, just don't be intimidated and be transparent. You know, for a, I never, not even for a moment, had thought about Maybe I should hide something from them because transparency is what saves you. I mean, I was very clear and open from the very beginning. I said, I don't have anything to hide. This is the nature of my work. This is what I do. And I continue to say it until the day they let me leave Great. the country. Great. Thank you. Let's uh, hop over to um, Dr. Gambisa. And also, we're just going to open it up in a second to questions. So I hope you'll ask the, the courageous and tough questions, as well as the um, uh, ones that you came here today to, um, to think and contemplate. 
You were born and raised in a small rural community in Ethiopia, and, and as I said in my introduction, um, have gone on to become one of the world's um, most leading scientists, and for that we are eternally grateful. But as a science diaspora, how can um, science uh, scientists um, in the diaspora community contribute to the scientific uh, capacity building in the developing countries? Because, and what challenges do they face in sort of re-engaging? And what advice do you have so that we can grow uh, that uh, uh, that expertise and that capability? Because I believe the next uh, idea for a green revolution is likely to actually come from a developing uh, world scientist uh, uh, with, um, and perhaps in conjunction with the scientists in America. So scientific diaspora contributions, what advice do you have and what learnings do you have? Well, um, I think the implicit premise for the engagement of the diaspora, whether it is in education, in science, in business, or in diplomacy, is, as has been discussed already, is that this core value development that we tend to have, because we're all products of our experiences, and as we live in a, in a foreign land and we assimilate, we develop and understand the core values of the society where we live in. At the same time, we also have the core value that was involved in the traditions and so on that we brought in. And so it's, um, Dr. Shah spoke about the depths of uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the commitment and so on, but this blending of core values is really what makes the diaspora potentially effective in, in engagement in all of these areas. And so as an individual who have benefited from American education, and as an individual who have developed um, my professional experience here, uh, in my field in science, um, and particularly science that helps in development, and the thing that I appreciate, it's something that most scientists um, that have studied in this country appreciate, and that is that science, technology, and innovation is really an important lever in advancing the development agenda. In fact, the AAAS uh, Science Magazine said in a study that 85% of all economic uh, activity uh, in the last 40 years globally has been as a result of science, technology, and innovation. So yep. to your point, if there is somebody sitting in the audience or live streaming or following us on Twitter who is a scientist, uh, who comes from a country of origin that they want to give back to, what's the first one or two or three things um, ought they to do to try and see how they could give back and uh, leverage their skill set? Now, one of the things that I want, you know, just finishing my thought, one of the things that I wanted to say was that as powerful as science, technology, and innovation is, are, they don't operate in a vacuum. Yeah. And the things that make them happen are the investment that are necessary and the commitment and the resolve in the governance and the policy making that need to be there. Yeah. And so one of the things that happen in this country, that's the best education I, can, I have because this is my experience, is that to make that happen, institutions need to develop. Human institutional capacity development needs to be there. And the role, the defined and evolving role of public and private organizations in each one of these communities is very important. A defined role that the public agencies have, not only in investing in education, in institution building, but also in governance and policy to make sure the environment is right not only for scientists as well as for businesses to thrive, because the beauty that we saw in a community like this is where those science and technology and innovations are translated into products and technologies that would make a difference in the lives of people. Yeah. And so these needs to be working together. So one of the first lessons then is that that recognition to be is, is necessary, and that is that technology and innovation is important, but also the public-private partnership that needs to be there 
and the beauty and the magic that happens when that is there so that scientists would have the, the incentives necessary to, to produce because their inventions and their products can make a difference in the lives of people and, and then a win-win environment is created. Yeah. And this country, among many, is really a great example, particularly in my field of science and agriculture, in really establishing this as, as a magical combination, yeah. where investments in science and technology by public agencies, even though the private also does that, I think the power of the private sector is in developing those enterprises generating employment and creating opportunity. Right, who can take it out of the lab and commercialize it in that, some right. way. So right. I think you're absolutely right. Whether you're a global company uh, in the private sector, whether you're a local company in a country, or whether you're a government that cares about uh, policy, public-private partnerships, we've just begun to scratch the surface of where the opportunity is. And I think it's a great reminder that science and technology doesn't, and innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. That it can be catalytic, but it can only be catalytic if that magic dust of some good public policy and some good commercial models and commercial distribution systems um, can lever that. So let's open it up, as I said, to the audience. We're going to take a, uh, continue the tradition of taking a couple questions at one time. There's lots of opportunity to meet these people later. So I'd appreciate it if you um, uh, have it more of a question than, uh, uh, than uh, a long statement. So uh, why don't we, uh, uh, this gentleman right here at this table, and then there's a woman in the orange coat here next. Good morning. Again, this is uh, Mamadi Kamara from uh, the Guinea Diaspora Network. My question is for Bill. Um, based on the researches that I actually have done uh, personally, MV, uh, pro the uh, mobile banking program has been uh, a successful program in Haiti, for instance. And um, one of the um, questions that, that I have been asking is understanding that there are local you know, cell phone carriers in these countries or anywhere around the world now. What are the challenges actually you're facing uh, in terms of you know, dealing with the, uh, those, uh, uh, you know, the, the companies that are uh, in the local countries? Okay. Is there any way around that? Or do you have any, um, is there a conflict of interest? If so, can you please uh, elaborate on that? Also, how can a uh, this program be tested in any particular country is do you have any criteria or you know is there any uh, way of uh, working with you to implement these uh, this program in uh, our countries for instance right. thank you so um, let's get to the woman in orange but bill could you also tell us when you answer that how many countries you're currently operating in and what the plans are for expansion in the next year or two Yes. Good morning. I'm Karen Oates. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences at WPI Scientist. And I'm very interested in how we can use the power of our students who do projects all over the world to help the diaspora movement. It seems to me that there's this great potential that we have in the students while we have them at the universities, not only for the science, but also diplomacy and understanding and what programs do we have that really help our students um, early on in their careers get involved? Okay, great. So why don't we take, uh, actually why don't we take one more and then right here in the front and then, uh, and then we'll uh, answer. Yep. Yes, my name is Lansana Koroma. I'm the president for International Forum for the Rights of Black People. My is a suggestion. Uh, I'm suggesting if you want to succeed, there are so many individuals who came to U.S. because of the opportunity to create a nonprofit. There are people who started working from where they were before coming to the United States. We have to distinguish those two groups. Then in order for us to work, like you said, we are forced from their countries to the United States. Why can't us have a committee of the diaspora in the United States, whether 20 or 40 people, from all over the world in the United States so that the government can work with that group direct to really seek the problems that Africa and the world has. Because the reason is, if we don't do that, every year coming to conferences, have a lengthy discussions, and so many people go and have picture with the president, with the vice president, it's not helping. 
If we really want to make a difference, so we need we to deepen that. Thank you. So the next thing we need to do is how can these 20 or 30 people recognized by the government sit with the government, say, okay, this is what we think we have searched right. for, uh, for the world to go. We want you to help us to implement it. Then you bring in something for us to implement. Thank you very much. Right. These are fantastic um, questions and comments. I'll start with Bill, and I hope our other panelists will jump in on one or more of these questions as well. Bill? Sure. Um, start with the, the questions on, on boom and, and some of the trials and tribulations of working in different markets. Um, so um, the United States is interesting in terms of the number of countries that we obviously uh, send money to from Mexico, which is a top 10 economy in the world, to Haiti, which is the poorest country in the, in the Western Hemisphere, to my knowledge. Uh, and so the infrastructure that you're dealing with in, in, in both markets is, is uh, totally different, right? There's a, a viable data network, for example, a mobile data network in Mexico. Um, there's a mobile data network in Haiti, but nobody's using it from their phones, right? People are using it from their home PC via USB modems, but the level of data usage on, a, on an actual phone is very, very low. Uh, and it tends to be from the uber rich who go to Miami and buy an iPhone uh, and bring it home, which is like you know less than one percent of the phones, which are using ninety nine percent of the data. So to deploy mobile money into Haiti, not only did we have that problem, but you have a literacy problem because using text messaging is very difficult when people can't read and write. So we went to the the local carrier, uh, Digicel, who, who in this case ended up investing in the company. Um, which was not our intent originally, but they did, and, and we built uh, what's called the USSD gateway. And so those of you from Africa who've ever, you know, type a star one, two, three pound into your phone and you get a menu on your phone, um, that allows you to basically use data services on your phone without actually paying the carrier for data. Uh, and to my knowledge, we're the only non-carrier uh, uh, mobile banking company in the world that, that has that. And, and so, but it really required a very tight partnership between us uh, and, and Digicel to make that happen. And, um, uh, but in, in Mexico, for example, Android proliferation is significant now. Uh, and, and so it's a, different, you know, it's a different dynamic. And so for each country that we go into, we have to really understand the nuances of what's going on in the ground, who's receiving the money, what capabilities do they have, what level of literacy do they have, what's the potential for them to understand the financial aspects of a mobile banking account, for example. Uh, and all of that has to be kind of put into this primordial mobile banking soup before you can understand what you're going to deploy. So how many countries are you in now? And yeah. well, what, what are your expansion plans? And if somebody has an idea of the country that they'd like to uh, uh, encourage you to go into, what do they do? Yeah, so we're very uh, US centric today. So okay. we, we basically work from the US out. So as I mentioned, we kind of treat this like a social network in so far that we're, we're banking the sender on the US side from their phone, uh, and they get a credit union account on their phone, and then we automatically bank the recipient uh, in their home country, right? So we started out in Mexico, we're, we're deploying, actually we just started in Haiti, uh, and we'll be in other markets uh, very soon as well. We'll probably be in five or six countries by this time next year. Okay. Uh, and, but again, it's a very US-centric approach, so if you know the the top recipients of, of remittances and uh, you know, where the unbanked populations are in the US and where those immigrant communities are, there's a pretty good chance that that's what we're, what we're focused on going focused forward. On. Okay, so how about uh, a couple other questions about, we have all this vibrant youth in, uh, that are in, uh, engaged in either undergraduate or graduate. How do we get them um, plugged into global work? How do we extend them? and harness that, uh, that seems like uh, a Professor Purdue might have some thoughts <laughs> on uh, uh, that uh, as well as our Middle East expert. Uh, but also, how do we take this more one-off uh, one uh, participation with governments and formalize it in some way that, uh, uh, that creates more citizen diplomacy? So either one of those. Well, I'm not sure I can uh, provide effective good answer, but just to acknowledge the comments made on both sides. I think, you know, when you can have a diaspora activity as an individual, uh, but when we have so many individuals operating in, in a realm such as that, um, there is a tendency to be fractured and not as effective. And I was just talking with someone just before the session, exactly the same thing, lamenting this fact. But, but the challenge then becomes, 
how you would organize the seemingly disparate kind of entities that exist um, in, in, in something that can be potentially formidable, as, as you can say, as you indicated. And, but, but I think we need to do that because that way you can have a lot more focus, a lot more pro programmatic in, in terms of the, the, the target. Uh, so something needs to be done, perhaps not as a continent level, but at least at the country level. One can, one can consider doing something like that because we as diaspora need to come together, um, leaving our other biases aside, focused specifically on advancing the cause of development in, in the continent. But that takes a, a higher level of commitment uh, than we as, as individuals, we tend to show a, a lot more. Um, the, I thought maybe Maura, you would answer that a lot more, but I think yeah. the only thing I wanted to say was at the highest level of government, there seemed to be that acknowledgement. I know the administrator has... Uh, we are working on a program. <laughs> That's what he's referring to, yeah, yeah. a fellowship program to actually give uh, uh, hundreds of young people opportunities to actually go abroad to do that. We just haven't fully cooked it or ready to announce it. So, uh, so uh, pretend you didn't actually hear me give you a sneak preview of it. But we completely agree with you and think it is just tremendous and uh, are just figuring out all the logistics of how would you do that and uh, how do you plug that in to be a meaningful experience uh, uh, rather than a summer vacation. And so, uh, uh, and that's what, and so if you have any ideas on that, we're all ears. Well, can I Yes, add? please. Uh, having taught at Princeton, I mean, you always find a group of students who are very much interested in uh, going to different countries. And uh, the problem is to make sure that there is a fellowship for them and there is at the other end, an institution which will welcome them and will offer them an internship. It's much easier to get an internship in this country working with different think tanks which necessarily don't work on diaspora issues, but then the diaspora group, although they are very fragmented, but they still have different organization and they always welcome these uh, young students to come and work for them as an intern. So you need to go and do the research and there is this opportunity. And of course, at the end of the day, there is Peace Corps once they graduate, which has been a very successful program over many decades. Yeah, great. Well, this is our last round and then we're gonna take a break. So this uh, woman in the gray suit here, um, the woman back there, and then there was somebody uh, uh, let's actually, how about the man in the very, very back? So we'll do those as our last three before we take a break. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Alessandra de Silva Pru, and I would like to talk as a PhD student um, and go in the direction of the pro professor's comment. Um, I, I, I was born in Kivert, and I grew up in uh, Paris, Switzerland, in Portugal and now here. I always had trouble to, to have my single mom to help me with the school, like men of you in this room. So I kind of uh, knock in every single door to seek for scholarships and ways in which I could uh, um, go to school because I knew that school was the only key to open all the doors that I wanted to make sure they, they were open. So, um, and uh, while I was uh, here and there, I realized that many of us never thought about going back to uh, share the experience that we had as a student, as a teachers, as a scientist. So do you have a suggestion for Yes, me? I do. Okay, great. That's why I create this uh, company, organization by the name Awoke, a world of opportunities for knowledge and education that is seeking to link the diaspora to uh, the country of the origin, how? Okay, I am a, a PhD student and teacher. Okay, so I appreciate that. And is there a URL? Because um, we're actually already I into a coffee break. So, and I got two more questions and some. So is there a URL that people could go look at it? Yes, of course. And, and what's I, it called? A work. 
a oh, world for opportunities for knowledge and education. Fabulous. And the, ba the basic idea is us going back and share what we learn instead of asking, uh, oh, what can um, the country do for us? Is, but is going to the ground. So That's that is fantastic. the idea that I would like to share here. That's fantastic. And congratulations and thank you so much for doing that. We've got a woman here. Good morning. My name is Terry Awal. I am with the American Federation of Ramallah, Palestine with Project Hope. And actually, I have a comment and question about leveraging. Uh, you talked about involving youth, young people, and, you know, who could go and volunteer. We have a Project Hope. We started in 1997, where every year we take 20 to 30 kids to Palestine and work in Project. And tell you the truth, we, the people in here, get more out of it than the people in there because it builds leadership. We have programs. We work in nonprofits. We work with the municipality. Our issue is it's always crossing the border to go to Palestine. We get a lot of uh, um, problems with the authority allowing us to enter in Palestine. But I advise that everybody could do this. We would like to expand the program to leverage it. We're not only taking pa Palestinian kids, we'd like to take others because it's meaningful to them as well. Great. That's one thing. And do you have a question for us? Yeah, the question is, how do we work with you to leverage this program and expand it? Because it really helps the two communities, the U.S. and the Palestinian community and other communities as well. Great. Thank you so, so much for what you're doing, and we'll hope to give you some suggestions. How about way back here? Yep. Thank you. My name is Amos um, from Boston, originally from Kenya. Uh, my question goes to Bill. Uh, I did not hear Africa mentioned. I heard about Mexico. And I know there's a lot of progress happening in Africa, and specifically Kenya with Safaricom and M-Pesa. I don't know how much you know about that program. And uh, I would like to know um, what do you have for specific countries that already have a mobile money network in place? Do you work with them? And how do you go along with that? And how can we as the diaspora come in and bridge the gap? Okay. So um, uh, interesting questions. I also think that uh, we will um, get your URL and we'll tweet it out to hashtag um, 2013 to so the Global Diaspora Forum. So if you could see Romy or somebody else at the break, give them that. We'll tweet it out so that people want to learn more. Same with your organization as well. Um, and so we can engage everybody in the conversation about ideas. But anybody on the panel want to take any of those questions or any additional thoughts? This is our last fire round. So if you meant to say something that you hadn't, this is the moment as well. Uh, you asked yes. all the right questions and we answered yes. it. So do you have any suggestions for um, uh, expanding expansion, uh, programs where uh, people want to bring uh, students or young people to country, their countries of origin to do work? Anybody have any ideas about how, where people might go or how they might think about expansion? It has to be done through their uh, universities. That's yeah. very important because it also give them, gives them a cushion of safety. I mean, you just can't have an organization which is not affiliated to anything, you yeah. know, and just send students there. The universities are the best place. If USAID can fund the universities to organize such trips, that would be wonderful. And it's going to be welcomed by countries that are friendly to the United States and less friendly to the United yeah. States because it has an academic uh, cushion or cup. Great. That's all. Bill, they said about Africa and uh, Boom Financial, um, obviously that's a hotbed of mobile money. So he wants to know how come you're not there and are you thinking about it? Yeah. Uh, so there's two questions. I think the first was plans for Africa and the second one was working with carriers who already have um, existing mobile money deployments. So on, on Boom working in Africa, we have, um, we have a lot of research going on. We're not ready to announce anything, but I'm personally really interested in deploying Boom in Africa. Um, Nigeria in particular is very interesting to me. Um, and, and so I keep sending money over there anyway, well, these emails I get, so I figured at some point I should send them to a <laughs> bank account. Um, so, um, but to your question about mobile money, um, uh, deployed by carriers and us working with them. 
So this is a, actually, it's actually a harder question than you probably realize. Um, up until now, all accounts and all customers that we service all have Boom accounts. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, for us to start interoperating with carriers is actually very complicated from a legal perspective, but we are working on it. And I think we have a solution now <coughs> that we're planning to deploy, hopefully either later this year or early next year, so that if you have a, a mobile wallet in an existing country um, that we could quickly interoperate with, that would allow uh, the two to, to kind of work together seamlessly. So it's something that we would like to do, um, but the regulation has kind of hindered that a little bit so far, and I think we're far trying to find ways to work within the existing frameworks. Okay. So. Dr. Ujeta, you get the last word of wisdom today, so uh, um, what would you like to share with us? Well, um, maybe reinforce on some of the things that we'd said earlier and, and, and the challenges that I see as diaspora try to engage in the various continents where we all come from. And that is the one thing that we'd already mentioned, and that is uh, organization. And uh, how well to organize, organize with distinction, you know. We, we don't want to be another series of NGOs and that would, you know, that increases the number and potentially can be disruptive if you look at it from the perspective of those in the various countries where we all come from. Because as you have all of these organizations coming at them, more than the benefit, it can potentially be very disruptive. So having to think about how you may organize yourself uh, so that you have that acceptance and as well as being effective. So that trying to create an organization of distinction should ought to be the goals that we all ha should have in mind. And, and as a result of that, the, the other challenge that I know we all, you all face here is a challenge of resources, not having a defined part of funds in the private sector or in the foundation or the public sector that are sufficient enough to address all of the needs that are out there. And so my uh, wishful thinking is as you organize creatively, you may entice donor agencies to be responsive to those kinds of organizations that are distinct enough and worth supporting. And the other thing that I will, I will plead that you all think about is sustainability of the the in, you know, interventions that you come up with. It's so easy to come up with something that can have a defined role that functions but, and, and, and even solves problem, but long after you're gone, uh, is that have a potential of sustainability because the government and the programs on the ground have appreciated it and therefore they would take it over or the funding agencies have recognized in such a way that they would bridge through you uh, that the national programs would take them over. These are issues that I, as a person just from a distance, watching how our diaspora try to engage, and the problems that I see not having really defined very well. The organizational, the, the resource challenges, and the issue of sustainability is, is the thing that I think are very crucial. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining the conversation. We hope that you will um, continue as well as uh, online. Um, please join me in thanking this awesome panel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Romy. We'll now take a 15-minute coffee break and then reconvene here in the pavilion room for our open session, which will be an opportunity for all of you to interact with representatives from different U.S. government uh, agencies, offices, to talk about public-private partnerships. So uh, coffee is served outside, and please, let's reconvene at 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>